Hello. Welcome to the Seaward PAT Refresher webinar series. This is session one, Introduction to PAT. My name's Kevin Smith. I'm Category Manager here at Seaward, and I'll be taking you through this webinar series. If you want to get in touch with me uh, about the webinar series or just in generally, you can connect with me via my LinkedIn profile. Search me on LinkedIn. And I'm also active on a lot of the, the PAT testing forums on Facebook. So what are we going to cover today? Well, this is session one in a new series of webinars that we're going to be running each Friday. Um, and we've called the, the series PAT Refresher. So really, it's giving you a good overview of, of PAT testing, really getting you back to basics. And we're going to be running these over eight weeks, over eight sessions. So it gives us a lot of time to get into the detail, get into the nitty gritty and maybe pick up the things that you've, you've forgotten or explain a bit more of the detail. So in session one, we've called this an introduction to PAT. And we're going to look at what is PAT testing, the legal requirements, who can PAT test, what equipment should be included in PAT testing, so what, what do you need to PAT test, and then at the end we'll have time to be able to answer your questions as well. So that's the, that's the agenda for the webinar today. So where do we start? Well, what is PAT? So PAT, or PAT testing, to give it the full name, uh, PAT stands for Portable Appliance Testing. And it's the generic name given to the process of inspecting and testing electrical equipment in the workplace. To perform the testing part of PAT, you obviously need a PAT tester. That's a piece of test equipment. And the PAT tester is a piece of electrical test equipment that allows us to quickly and easily check that the appliance has a good earth connection. Obviously, that's for class one or earthed equipment. And that the insulation is working correctly. So separating us from the, from the live parts. So when performing PAT testing, we are using a process of visual inspection, electrical and functional tests to determine that an item of electrical equipment is safe for continuing use and that no maintenance is required. Each item must be treated as unsafe until we've confirmed its safety. So we start with isolating and visually inspecting the equipment and only progress to electrical testing and finally functional testing when the subsequent inspection or test is passed. Inspection and testing are just part of the whole PAT process. So you can see here on the right hand side of the screen, we've got our, our diagram that we use on many of our many of our workshops and webinars. And this outlines the whole PAT process, the PAT process in its in its entirety. So generally, the way we, we look at this is we, we tend to look at it as a cycle. Um, but we start off generally in the, the top right hand corner there with compile an asset register. We need an asset register to put everything on so that we know what do we need to risk assess, what have we got, what are we dealing with. So we put everything on the asset register. We then determine the various factors. So where's it going to be used? Who's it going to be used by? How's it constructed? And that allows us then to carry out the risk assessment. Once we've carried out the risk assessment, we can determine the frequency and type of testing that we're going to carry out. We obviously then perform the inspection and testing at those frequencies, record the results, label the assets, maintain the records, keep everything up to date, because remember your records are your evidence that you've been complying with the legal requirements, and then the process continues. We keep the asset register up to date, we add items, we remove items, we update the risk assessment for any changes in factors, and the whole process continues round. So that's the whole PAT process. And you can see actually performing inspection and testing, the bit that's traditionally thought of as PAT, is just one of those parts within that process. So the process is widely adopted by companies to manage the safety of electrical equipment in the workplace. It's based on risk, and inspection and testing are control measures used to mitigate risk 
to acceptable levels. I'll talk later on in this series of webinars a lot about risk assessment, but essentially that's what we're doing. We're assessing risk and then we're using inspection and testing as a control measure to control the risks posed by that equipment in the workplace. So why do companies do PAT? There's various reasons, and as we, we'll look at in a, a little bit more detail later on in this, this uh, part of the webinar, um, legal requirements to maintain equipment in a safe condition and assess risk. So there are some legal requirements we've got to comply with. So why do companies do PAT? To comply with their legal requirements. Reduce the risk of fire. You can see from the picture on the on the right hand side there. One of the main risks um, posed by electrical equipment in the workplace is not electric shock. Actually, thankfully, electrocution and death, certainly deaths by electrocution are very low. But fires continue to be a problem. So one of the main risks posed by equipment is fire. Why do we do pat testing? to reduce the risk of fire maybe because as well it's specified in our fire risk assessments too identify counterfeit equipment and product recalls this is becoming more common people are seeing a lot more counterfeit equipment entering the workplace being bought through uh, online sellers and things like that we've got a very diverse sub online supply chains nowadays and there's a lot of equipment entering the workplace that's substandard um, and there's also product recalls and things like that are in place. So by doing PAT testing, we can actually identify a lot of this counterfeit equipment. Not all of it. Um, some of it can be quite difficult to spot. That's maybe where we need to do the testing part. You know, some of these can be detected more easily with a PAT tester. Um, but another reason for doing PAT is identifying counterfeit substandard equipment and products that have been recalled. New goods inspections. Again, when we've got new goods entering the workplace, we want to make sure that these things are safe and working. And this ties in quite quite uh, well with the, the, the factors above. Um, so as a new goods inspection or an inspection of equipment entering the workplace, that's quite often where PAT testing fits in. Testing after repair. Sometimes if we've carried out repair, like we've changed a plug on a piece of equipment, we would then perform PAT testing to make sure that we've actually, you know, returned um, that to a safe condition and that we've made sure that things like the earth connection are, are still intact after we've carried out the repair. I'll talk a little bit more about testing after repair later on. Insurance company requirements. Again, your insurance company may say as part of your policy, you have to have PAT testing done every 12 months. Now, you could risk assess it and say, no, actually, I think it's every three years. But if your insurance company says every 12 months and that's a term of your policy, then it's going to get done every 12 months. So, again, always check your insurance requirements to make sure that you're actually doing these things. Uh, and we're not, we're not actually contravening any of those, those requirements by um, the frequencies that we're actually doing or not doing PAT testing at. Government licensing requirements. Again, if you're running something like a you know, a caravan site, a petrol station, if you're running um, a public venue where you've got an entertainment license, there may well be government requirements that say you've got to get your equipment tested at set intervals. So again, if you are in that situation where you've got a license to operate, again, check those requirements. Fear of compensation claims. Yeah, I mean, this is this is one of the big ones. Um, companies are always worried, particularly large organisations, that they're gonna somebody's gonna have electric shock, somebody's gonna get injured, and obviously they're gonna sue that that uh, company uh, for money by way of compensation. So again, that's one of the reasons why companies do part testing. So you can see there's a lot of diverse reasons there. Yes, there is the legal requirements that we generally talk about, but there's all these other reasons as well. And that's what makes PAT so widely adopted and, and you know so widely applicable really because there's there's many reasons why we would want to carry it out. It's a good it's a good thing to do for so many reasons. So I said I was going to talk a little bit more about testing after repair and that's that's on this slide here you'll see but um, PAT testing traditionally in the UK, we talk about PAT testing, we think about traditional PAT testing covered by the IET Code of Practice, and you'll see there we've listed the, the guidance there from the IET Code of Practice, uh, fourth edition, and soon later this year to be the fifth edition of the IET Code of Practice, and that really covers the general PAT testing that we'd, we'd understand as PAT testing, you know, the, the in-service inspection testing of equipment in the workplace. 
Now, there is additional guidance above and beyond that. So Health and Safety Executive have got their guidance document, which covers PAT testing, HSG 107. So again, that's another document um, that's worth checking out and seeing their guidance. However, you may actually be testing medical equipment, for example. So you might work in a hospital, a care home, dentists, tattoo parlor, wherever it is, where they're actually using applied parts, where they're actually in a, a medical environment. And as I say nowadays, this isn't just, you know, operating theatres, this can be care homes, this can be even certain beauty treatments and all those things can fall in under these requirements. So again, with those, we've got two different standards there. We've got um, EN 62353, that pretty much covers the in-service testing of medical equipment more the PAT testing of medical equipment. Um, and then we've got EN 60601. And EN 60601 uh, covers more the manufacturing of medical equipment. So for those of you who might be familiar with uh, the Rigel brand, part of the, the Seawood, Seawood family, our sister company, Rigel, Rigel Medical, um, they actually provide products to carry out the test to these standards. So if you're familiar with working in hospitals and things, you might have seen the Rigel products there testing to these standards. Um, but if you are working in medical environments, again, it might be worth checking that out. We've got a lot of a lot of information from Rigel on those standards. Now, again, another part of the, the Seawood family, you may have come across our Claire products. Um, our Claire Hal um, products generally cover production testing. And production testing is actually ensuring that equipment complies with the standard that we're manufacturing it to. So, for example, if we've got um, IT equipment that may need to comply with uh, 62368, we need to be testing that at the end of the production line to check that it does actually comply. Or if we are, say, testing washing machines and we're checking those washing machines coming off the end of the production line, we do production testing and they're normally done to a, an EN or a BSEN standard. Um, and again, our, our Claire Hal uh, range of products really sits in for doing production line testing. Also under the Claire range, you may have come across some of our higher products. Um, so if you're working in the tool hire industry, maybe, or equipment hire industry, um, you might be a member of the, the Hire Association of Europe, the HSA, um, HAE. Sorry. Um, HAE actually have their own code of practice, um, particularly aimed at, aimed at higher equipment. So from that side of things, there's different tests that you may need to apply. So that's worth checking out. And again, you'll be aware of our, our clear range of products that, uh, that cover that, that sector. Now, the final bit on here and something I, I mentioned earlier was, was testing after repair. Now, testing after repair, you might need to apply any of these standards on here. It depends what level of repair you've gone to. Uh, and also what your policies are and what your duty holder has set out and your risk assessments and all those sort of things. So, for example, if you've just changed a plug, that may be perfectly acceptable to just do a, a normal PAT test under the, the, the fourth edition code of practice and actually deem that piece of equipment. Yep, that's safe and away we go. Now, if you've taken a piece of equipment into tiny little bits, say you've got a microwave and you've taken it into tiny little bits, you've put it back together again, just a simple PAT test might not be enough to tell you that it's actually met the same uh, manufacturing specifications that it did when it was new. So you may want to actually uh, apply a production test to that to make sure that the thing actually meets the original standards. So again, it depends on the level of repair you've done and your risk assessment, which standards you would apply if you are testing after repair. But what you can't do is just carry out a huge, really complicated repair, particularly on an enclosure. You know, you actually glued an enclosure back together or you've done something like that, which may affect the insulation of it and the integrity of the enclosure and all sorts of things. And you just do a quick beep beep on a pat tester and say, yep, that's fine, back into service you need to be able to test proportionate to the level of repair that you've carried out. So it is very important if you are repairing equipment to just think about the level of testing that you, you are actually going to carry out and how you're going to do that. And obviously you can get in touch with us and we can, we can provide you with more information on those. Now I've made a point on there, whichever guidance you work to, you must always keep records. Record keeping is very, very important because as we said before, it's your evidence that you've complied. So whichever standard you're complying to, whatever you're doing, obviously keep records, record your results and make sure you've got all that information stored should you need it in the future. Okay, so the next section we're going to have a look at 
or the next question we're going to answer is, is PAT a legal requirement? So the law surrounding PAT is not as black and white as you may think. And often many of our assumptions about the law have no legal basis. Two common examples are that the law says we must PAT test every 12 months and that we only need to, to test portable appliances with a three pin plug attached. Both of these examples have no legal basis, as you'll see from the coming slides. The main areas of law that relate to PAT are our duties to ensure equipment is maintained in a safe condition, that those persons undertaking PAT are competent to do so, and that we have carried out a risk assessment on the equipment. So here we go. This is the first one. This is really PAT testing in one slide. This is Regulation 4, Paragraph 2 of the Electricity at Work Regulations, 1989. And this is as close as we get to the legal case for PAT testing. So I'll go through this. I'll read it, read through, and then we'll, we'll discuss a little bit more about what this says in, in a little bit more detail. So it says, as may be necessary to prevent danger, all systems shall be maintained so as to prevent, so far as is reasonably practicable, such danger. So we've got a legal duty to maintain all systems. So it doesn't say all appliances, it doesn't say all portable appliances, it doesn't say everything with a plug on. It says all systems and that, that refers to electrical systems and it includes electrical equipment. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. So all systems shall be maintained to prevent danger. So the legal duty is we've got to maintain electrical equipment to prevent danger. So why do we do inspection and testing? Well, inspection and testing are means of determining where the maintenance is required. So whenever you are doing PAT testing, what you are doing is you're making a decision of does this equipment need maintenance to avoid danger? So you're having a look to make sure it's in a good condition and that any of the, you know, the maintainable parts, the wearing parts are also in a good condition. And if any maintenance is required to prevent danger, that's what we've got to get carried out. So interestingly enough, although we, we do talk about inspection and testing and PAT is inspection and testing, the legal duty is maintenance ensuring that equipment is maintained to avoid danger. So how often should I test? Well, really, Regulation 4, Paragraph 2 there tells us how often we should test. So we've got to test enough to prevent danger but it's also got to be reasonable and practical, so much as is reasonably practicable. So enough to prevent danger. We could say, right, we're going to test everything every day. That would be enough to prevent danger, but it wouldn't be reasonable and it wouldn't be practical. So it's this balance, hence the diagram on here, it's this balance between what's enough to prevent danger, but also what's reasonable and practical. And how do we work out that balance? How do we make that decision? And that's through risk assessment. So by carrying out your risk assessment, you are working out what's enough to prevent danger, what can I do to prevent danger, but also you're balancing that against what's reasonable and practical. And by assessing the levels of risk, you can work out that balance. And by doing that, you'll work out how often you should actually carry out your PAT tests. And as I said, later in the series, we're going to do a, a webinar specifically on risk assessment. So I won't go into too much detail on the actual risk assessment process here, but it's just the understanding that it's a balance between enough to prevent danger, but it's got to be reasonable and practical. And we use the risk assessment to do that. And this is where this myth of, you know, we must test everything every 12 months falls apart. Um, because generally the 12 months is actually too long for high risk items. So if you've got a grind on a building site, you know, there's a lot can go wrong with that in 12 months. But if you take something like a, a computer in an office, 12 months is probably too short because really the level of risk that that poses and the likelihood of it going wrong, really 12 months is probably too often. 
So you end up with this halfway house in the middle. It isn't really good enough for fit for high risk items, but actually your low risk items is probably too often. Um, so it's important why we use risk based pat testing to work out this balance between what's enough to prevent danger and what's reasonable and practical. So competence, we talked earlier about, you know, who can pat test competence, where does that fit in? And that's actually regulation 16 of the Electricity at Work regulations 1989. So what does it say? It says, no person shall be engaged in any work activity where technical knowledge or experience is necessary to prevent danger or where appropriate injury unless he possesses such knowledge or experience or is under such a degree of supervision as may be appropriate having regard to the nature of the work. So this is quite an important thing really. Um, it's saying that we've got to be competent. The person who actually carries out the testing, you know, is working on or near electrical equipment has got to be competent. And to be competent, it says we've got to have the knowledge or experience. Where knowledge or experience is required to avoid danger and injury, we've got to have that knowledge or experience. And that's that's the important takeaway really from Regulation 16. And Regulation 16 is very important because it's an easy prosecution for the HSE. If something goes wrong, you can get prosecuted under Regulation 16. And the argument is, well, obviously you didn't have enough knowledge and experience because something went wrong, somebody got electrocuted. So you didn't have enough knowledge and experience. And it's very hard to argue against that um, because obviously if something's gone wrong, chances are maybe you didn't have enough knowledge and experience. So how do we evidence that is really what we're getting towards. Now, the next legal requirement that we want to have a look at here is the legal requirement for risk assessment. And this is covered under the Management of Health and Safety at Work Regulations 1999. So in this it says, every employer shall make suitable assessment of the risks to the health and safety of his employees to which they're exposed whilst at work and the risks to the health and safety of persons not in his employment arising out of or in connection with the conduct by him of his undertaking. Ah, <sighs> quite a mouthful there. But the bits we want to look at on there is obviously we've got a legal duty to make risk assessments to assess the risk to the health and safety of employees, but also to people who aren't employed. And one mistake people quite often make when they're doing risk assessments is they focus solely on employees. And they'll say, right, all our staff have PPE. They've all had first aid training. They all know what to do in the case of an emergency. But is that also true of people who aren't employed? Your customers, the general public, passers-by, visitors, all of these people. So again, whenever we're doing risk assessments and whenever we're, we're assessing frequencies of inspection and testing and designing our PAT process, we need to think about not just the risks to employees, but also to people who aren't employed. And again, that's, that's a mistake people quite often make. So going back to competence then, who can do PAT testing? Who can actually carry out PAT testing? So, as we saw earlier, Regulation 16 of the Electricity at Work Regulations says we must be competent. And that this requires us to have enough knowledge or experience to avoid danger and injury. In each organisation, the duty holder must decide who they deem competent and what evidence of knowledge or experience they require. Now, that's an important point here. Somebody called the duty holder within an organisation. Now, this could be the managing director, could be the owner, might be delegated to somebody like the health and safety manager or maybe a facilities manager or maintenance manager. That person is the duty holder. Now, we all have duties under the electricity at work regulation, so we are in our own rights, all duty holders for things that are within our control. But normally within organisations we have somebody and we deem that person the duty holder and they're the person responsible for making sure that we comply with the regulations. So it's up to the duty holder to actually decide who is competent and who they are happy to carry out work within their organisation. So competence is dependent on many factors. And the more complex the range of equipment and environments, the greater the knowledge or experience we must have to be considered competent. Again, another important point here. 
somebody who's competent to carry out pat testing maybe in a a normal office environment might not be competent to actually carry out that in a factory in a mine on an oil rig you know where there's extra risks and dangers and things like this so you can't just assume that because you're competent in one environment that you're actually competent for all environments similarly with equipment somebody who's competent to test a simple vacuum cleaner may not be competent to test a welder or three phase equipment or fixed equipment for example so again we can't assume just because we're competent to do one piece of equipment in one environment that we're competent to do everything so health and safety executive guidance uh, document hsr 25 states that the scope of technical knowledge or experience should include so we've got to include all of these things within our technical knowledge and experience so we must have adequate knowledge of electricity so actually that's the properties of electricity how electricity works and a proper understanding of the thing that is electricity the theory understanding adequate experience of electrical work being carried out so we need to actually understand the job that's being carried out in our case inspection and testing adequate understanding of the system being worked on and practical experience of that class of system so for us that could be an understanding of class one equipment equipment with an earth do we understand why it has an earth how that works do we understand how we're protected against electric shock Class 2 equipment, double insulated equipment, again, same questions. Do we understand how that protects us against electric shock? Understanding of hazards which may arise during the work and the precautions which need to be taken. Again, precautions very important. The PPE, you know, the actual measures we need to put in place to make us as safe while we're doing it. And also things like how do we actually use the test equipment properly? You know, what hazards could arise? all of those sort of things so very important and finally and probably the most important one the ability to recognize at all times whether it's safe for work to continue obviously we only continue work where it's safe to do so and we need to be able to recognize what's safe and what's not safe so if you're trying to measure yourself to see if you're actually competent look at the type of equipment you're testing or going to test look at the environment you're going to do it in and then answer these questions do we have adequate knowledge of electricity adequate experience adequate understanding of the system being worked on an understanding of the hazards and the precautions and the ability to recognize whether it's safe to proceed if you can tick all those boxes then chances are you are competent but again it's the decision of the duty holder not you So it's clear from the previous slides that no single training course can make a person competent. Very important that sometimes people will sell you a competency course or they'll be there, what course do I need to go on to be competent? And obviously you can see there's things in there like experience. You know, experience isn't something you just get taught in a you know one-day course. Um, so again, it is important that you build up this whole um remit of skills this whole whole raft of skills and the knowledge part of it which you get from training is just part of the whole package it's a combination of up-to-date knowledge up to date very important again you know we need to understand it now not what it was 20 years ago so up-to-date knowledge and experience supported by evidence where's our evidence where's the certificates where's the cv that we actually did that because at the end of the day something goes wrong and we end up in court it's not what you did it's what you can prove that you did so again can we prove we've got that training have we got the paper records to back that up so knowledge and experience supported by evidence that allows the duty holder to determine who is competent and who isn't so it's still the duty holders decision but we must have that evidence so for those looking to work in this industry it's important that you build up your, a portfolio of your training and experience that you can share with your employer and with potential customers make it as easy for them to be able to deem you competent as possible you know you've got your records there you've got your training file all of your information in there you've got your cv your employment history all of that's in there it makes it so easy then for somebody to say yep i can see you've got sufficient knowledge and experience there 
in which case I deem you competent. And if you're a duty holder, because many people watching this webinar may well be duty holders in their own right, you must ensure the competence of those you allow to carry out PAT on your behalf. So whether that's testing within your own organisation, so they're employees of your organisation testing your own equipment, or whether you're bringing a contractor in to do it on your behalf, or even if you're employing a subcontractor to work for you, it's your duty to make sure that that person is competent. And if anything goes wrong, Potentially, you're going to have the health and safety executive coming to you saying, why did you believe that person was competent? Show me the evidence. So again, very, very important if you are a duty holder to make sure that you've got that evidence and you have done your due diligence to make sure that anybody working on your behalf is competent to do so. So the final part of the uh, the webinar now really is... Uh, what needs PAT testing? What, what's actually covered by PAT testing? We've looked at some of these things, but what, what is actually covered within PAT testing? So, Regulation 4, uh, Paragraph 2 of the Electricity at Work Regulations, uses the term systems. And this refers to electrical systems and includes electrical equipment. Electrical equipment, as defined in the regulations, includes every type of electrical equipment from, for example, a high voltage transmission overhead line to a battery powered hand lamp. There are no voltage limits in the regulations. The criteria are where the danger may arise. So whatever it is, whatever the voltage, whatever the size, if danger could arise from its use, and obviously the way we determine that is via the risk assessment, then we need to actually carry out testing on it. Um, and that's a quote directly, that, that paragraph there is a quote directly from HSC document HSR 25. So remember, the electricity at work regulations only apply to equipment used in places of work or to work equipment, so equipment used for work, provided by work for work. So again, you don't see the same requirements for this for domestic equipment because the electricity at work regulations applies to work equipment. However, in certain circumstances, potentially, say, a tradesperson goes in, say, a plumber goes into your house, that then becomes their place of work. So they do need to think about that. Um, but again, depends what equipment. Obviously, they're not going to be picking up your TV and your, you know, your your mobile phone and stuff to use. They're going to have their own equipment. But even if it's in somebody's house, if it's used for work and it's work equipment, then technically, it's it's covered under the electricity at work regulations, and we need to make sure it's safe. Even nowadays, when we're working from home, you know, there's a lot of home working going on currently at the moment. You know, we are responsible, our employers are responsible for the equipment that we are using while we're working from home. Um, so again, it is important that we, we understand the differences there of what is covered. You know, equipment in workplaces and equipment used for work purposes does fall under the electricity at work regulations and therefore PAT testing applies. So the duty holder must risk assess all electrical equipment used in the workplace. So we've got a duty to risk assess everything. Um, so this is everything used in the workplace or for work purposes. Uh, this should include battery powered equipment, three phase equipment, equipment that's permanently connected to, to the electrical installation, such as hand dryers, cookers. So it's just worth me explaining that a little bit. Quite often people say it's only everything with a plug on. So battery powered equipment don't need to do it. Well, We've just seen the legal quotes there that say, yes, we do. So even battery powered equipment, if it could give rise to danger, then yes, we do need to. Uh, we do need to actually ensure that's maintained in a safe condition. Now, again, am I worried about getting a shock off my mobile phone? No, not really from that side of things. But am I worried about maybe the charger going wrong and the thing catching fire? We've all seen videos on social media and stuff where charges have gone wrong, iPads have caught fire, you know, mobile phones have caught fire, things like that, maybe laptop batteries. So again, just to assume that because we're not worried about getting electric shock off it or it hasn't got a three-pin plug on that we don't need to do anything, 
is not necessarily correct. We need to risk assess it. And if the risk assessment says, actually, there is a chance that it could give rise to danger, then maybe we want to do something about it as part of the, the risk process. Now, that may just be a visual inspection. There may not be any meaningful tests you can do on that. So it might just be a visual inspection. And we put a sticker on and periodically we visually inspect it. That's fine. But we've risk assessed it. It's part of the process. What isn't right to do is just ignore it. Because if we've ignored it, something goes wrong, that's the worst case because we haven't assessed it, we haven't met our legal responsibilities, and then we're negligent. And that's that's what we want to try and avoid. Three-phase equipment, three-phase equipment, exactly the same as normal equipment. You know, many of the tests we carry out will be exactly the same. Um, and it still poses a risk. In fact, in many cases, it poses a higher risk. So why people would say, oh, no, no, Pat's only single-phase equipment, we don't do three-phase equipment. Again, not true. Um, and also the next one, equipment that's permanently connected to the electrical installation. Well, again, this myth, we only test stuff with a plug on. You know, I've spoken to so many people where they've cut the plugs off things and hardwired it into a fuse spur so it doesn't need pat testing. And obviously all they've done is made it harder to do. So it's important um, that we actually understand this whole thing of we must risk assess all electrical equipment. <laughs> Not just stuff with a plug on, not just stuff that you can pick up or carry around or whatever. There's no limits on size and weight and all that sort of stuff. Um, all electrical equipment needs risk assessing. And then as a base of the risk assessment, we then determine what we're going to do and what frequency at which we're going to do the inspection and testing process. So the risk assessment will determine the type and frequency of inspection and testing that will be carried out on the equipment and any other safety measures that will be employed, for example, RCD protection. So another good point now as part of the risk assessment, we might not just specify inspection and testing. We might say, actually, we're going to use certain PPE. We're going to insist that any users are trained. We're going to actually fit an RCD or we're going to make sure that it's used on a socket that's RCD protected. So there is other things we can work into risk assessment. I'll talk about this more in the risk assessment session later on. Um, but it is important that we understand the whole um, process there. And it's not just about inspection and testing. The risk assessment can include additional precautions as well. So in conclusion, session one, introduction to PAT. So what is PAT testing? So we've understood that PAT testing is a process of inspection and testing. However, that's the small bit of the wider process, which includes compiling the asset register, gathering the information, carrying out the risk assessment, defining the frequencies, doing the inspection and testing, recording the results, labeling the equipment, maintaining the records, and the whole process goes round again. So, so portable appliance testing is this process of inspecting and testing, but it's as part of the wider process. PAT process. The legal requirements, you saw our legal requirements there to maintain electrical equipment in a safe condition, that people have got to be competent to carry out testing, and that we've got a legal duty to carry out risk assessments on all electrical equipment. Who can PAT test? Well, who can PAT test? Those people who are deemed competent to do so by the duty holder. However, the duty holder must have evidence of knowledge and experience, and they must use the requirements there detailed by HSR 25, which tells you what knowledge and experience really people have got to have to be deemed competent. And finally there, what equipment should be included? Well, it's all, all electrical equipment in the workplace or used for work purposes must be included within portable appliance testing. It's not just everything with a plug on and there's no voltage limits and things like that in there. It's all equipment should be risk assessed and then as a basis of the risk assessment we then determine what levels and frequencies of inspection and testing are carried out. So hopefully that's been a, a good introduction to PAT. This has been a good start of session one. Um, next week We'll actually be looking at basic theory and terminology. So we'll go a little bit more into the volts, ohms, amps, what side of things, actually understanding the, the terminology and, and how these things are affected. And also the various sort of terms that we use within PAT testing, you know, what's a live part and things like that, what's what's an insulation, what's, you know, all, all that sort of stuff. We'll go into the, 
the terminology and the theory of it to make sure that we've got that that background that basis which then will help us when we go on to the later sessions to be able to understand a little bit more about about what's going on so that said it's now time for your questions i'm here to take uh take your questions now so it's over to you anything that wasn't covered in the session um, that you would like to see covered, you know, you like you were waiting for, and it didn't come up. Now's the time. You've got the chat box there, so feel free to uh, to type those questions into the chat box, and I'll I'll answer those as I can. Um, if we don't get time for any, or you've got anything that you want to um, go into in more detail, you can actually contact me via my social media, as I say, via LinkedIn or Facebook. Um, and also, probably a very good place to contact us is using our support email address. That's support at seaward.com uh, and you'll get through to Donovan um, and Donovan will be able to help you out in a lot more detail with that. So support at seaward.com um, for more detailed inquiries, things about your, your products and stuff like that that's not, not part of this uh, this session. We can follow that up and I hope to see you on the, the session next week. Get signed up for that and if there's anybody else you know um, can get signed up for that. So thanks very much for your time today. And I'll now open the session up to your questions.